Where would you say is the perfect first step for really being able to get rid of this clutter? What can this individual do to begin to manage this? Well, I could offer a few things, uh, even if it seems appropriate, maybe even just five specific things that people could do uh, to become, to make doing what's essential more effortless. Uh, and, and the first is, is simple and came to me from an entrepreneur uh, based in the UK uh, who started asking themselves one question every morning. What's the most important thing I need to do today? Uh, and I would add, if you ask that question, also with a secondary question of why does it matter so much to me uh, and get a little deeper as to the why you value it, it will help give you a clearer intent around your behavior for that day. Uh, for her, she started asking the question, the same question every day, but the answer changes. Uh, the, the, at first, it was something to do with her business, some key project. Then it became something to do with her health, protecting the asset, let's say it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's the asset. But then there was also there was also a moment where uh, her dad gave her a phone call and said, oh, your mom's in the hospital again. Uh, there's you know, nothing for you to worry about. It's nothing serious, just letting you know, keeping you in the loop. But that day she asked the question, uh, same question, but different answer. She knew exactly, clearly, I need to be there. Um, time seemed to stand still for her. She remembers the weather outside, everything. Uh, and so she makes the two hour trip to the hospital. So she's keep giving up the rest of her day to do this. And she says to her mom, when she sees her, look, I'm happy to be here. I love you. Mother says the same back to her. I love you too. Within an hour of that conversation to everyone's surprise, uh, her mother fell into a coma. Uh, and then, you know, within a week, uh, she had the unfortunate job of turning off the life support machine. So the reason I know about that story is because she wrote to me afterwards to say, if I hadn't been an essentialist that day, by asking that question every day, then I would have made a different trade-off and how different my moment and life would have been because of that. So that's the first thing you can do. Um, the second thing you can do is, is sort of inherent in that first story is, is to learn how to negotiate trade-offs. Because everything in life, and this is really key to the work that I do, is a trade-off. Every time we say yes to one thing, we're not just saying no to something else. We're saying no to 10 or 20 or 100 other things we could be doing. But often we evaluate decisions as if, well, I can, uh, you know, I can, you know, if, is it good? Mm -hmm. If it's a good thing, I say, yes, no problem, but we're not conscious of all these other trade-offs. And so we need to learn to, you know, first of all, be aware of the trade-offs and to then negotiate them with ourselves. Even the next time you have two things coming at you, choose one of them instead of just trying to do both. Uh, the next time you're negotiating it, even, even with a manager who comes to you and says, oh, I'd like you to do this. Uh, see if you can't find a way just to discuss Say, so, oh, yes, I'm happy to do this. This is what I'm doing right now. Is this more important? Now, you don't have to do that every time. But if you learn to negotiate trade-offs, uh, then, you, then, then you're going to make a lot of, uh, you're going to be more of an essentialist uh, and fast. Maybe I should pause. Do you want the other three? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't want a monologue here for you. Um, number three is I would suggest that people create buffer in their life. Uh, I'll suggest that they create two hours of buffer mm. in their everyday experience, broken into half an hour segments. Um, so these are meetings with yourself. Uh, they are blank periods. I learned the practice from Jeff Wiener, who's the former CEO of LinkedIn. He's an essentialist and he takes it pretty seriously. And as a result of it, he said to me, I can only think of one day as CEO that felt frenetic and frantic. Uh, 
uh, which to me is unthinkable. Wow. I mean, for the rest of us, our lives uh, can feel frenetic and frantic regularly. Yeah. And yet here with this enormously fast growing uh, startup in the middle of Silicon Valley didn't feel it. Well, one of the reasons for that was, uh, was this practice. Uh, he, he had it scheduled on his calendar, these four half an hour segments. And you, sometimes he would just use it to catch up on email so that he wasn't just overloaded by that. Sometimes he would use it to think, to plan, sometimes to deal with an emergency that had come up. But he stands distinctive from, the, from what most of us do, which is to, at least in today's vernacular in the pandemic, an eat, sleep, Zoom, repeat life. Yeah. You know, it's just a perpetual flow of meetings with no breaks. So you're often late for the next meeting uh, or you, uh, you know, you're stressed perpetually because you don't have time to prepare. So number three would be create buffer uh, on the schedule. I would say the fourth thing to do is, is to just get comfortable with the question, what does done look like? Uh, it's, a, it's a really simple question, uh, and it's, it's, it's almost so simple you think, well, do you really have to emphasize this? Uh, but actually, I found that you do, because many times when people start a task or a project, they have only a vague sense of what done really is. And so as a result, the chance of getting very uh, distracted onto, you know, by well-intended distractions, adding this you know, feature, this functionality, uh, you know, just overcomplicating something and always making it harder to get to the finish line. Uh, one application of that question is to create a done for the day list uh, so that when you're creating your plan for the day, instead of just having an endless to-do list, uh, which often, uh, often we have, uh, in fact, often our to-do list is longer by the end of the day than it is at the beginning, uh, in this instance, you say, okay, I'm going to do, I mean, let's say three things in your personal life, personal and family, and three things in your, uh, in your, in your business or profession. These are the, you know, the, the highest, most important things that you can do. And you're trying to craft a list that says, if I complete these, I will feel satisfied with today. These were the important things. And so when you're done, you can be done and you can say, okay. Uh, I, you know, that, that's a boundary. I can now avoid sneaky work going forward. Uh, so I would say, you know, this question, what does done look like, including doing that for today's planning session? And, and number five is a new question. It comes from the new book, Effortless, and it's to invert, always invert. That is to, instead of asking a question that most insecure overachievers ask, which is how can I achieve more by doing more? Uh, by working even harder, uh, instead to ask the question, how can I accomplish more uh, in, 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 by making it easier, mm. <laughs> by making it effortless? Uh, it, it, it runs quite countercultural, in fact, very countercultural, uh, to, to instead of just pushing harder, to actually look for easier. Uh, sometimes, sometimes overachievers have built into their minds the idea that that the only path the only virtuous path is harder and harder work it's like a puritan idea uh, and and i do think that working hard is a virtue of course i do um, and i also think that we shouldn't take it to the point of vice where we distrust the easy because as soon as you do that you remove all of this uh, all of these strategic um, paths that would help you to achieve the thing that matters, but without burning yourself out. So I was working with someone in just this situation. She's the, she's the kind of person who's up till 4 a.m. in the morning, photoshopping for a church youth group the next day. There's the, that's not her profession, and no one's asking her to do that. She just thinks, if I want to make a bigger contribution, I have to sleep less, I have to do more. And so I gave her this, you know, this magic question. Uh, and so she gets a call from her uh, professor at the university says, oh, I need you to get your team to come and, you know, to record my class for the semester. She already 
she's ready just to jump in. Yeah. Uh, well, we can get a whole team there for you if you'd like. We could have multiple cameras. Uh, we'll edit it all together, add music. We'll have some graphics, intros, outros, everything. I'm going to wow him. And then she stops the coaching. She remembers, ask a this different question, invert the question. Is there an effortless way, an easier way to achieve what you really want? Well, what do you want? What does done look like? Well, it's for one student who's going to miss a few classes because of an athletic commitment. Oh, well, what's the easiest way to solve that? Maybe we can have someone else in the class just record it on their iPhone and send it to him whenever he's going to miss. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. He's running too fast too. He's distressing the easy. Oh, let's just do that. Great. A 10-minute call solves his problem. And she hangs up the phone and she's like, I just saved four months of work for a whole team. And he's just as happy with the solution as, this, as if I had done that, perhaps even happier. There's less disruption for his world. So that's the power of inverting the question. Those are just five you know, specific things you know, off the top of my head for what people could do right now to make what's essential more effortless in their life.